Wendy Wood, welcome to The Next Big Idea. So excited to have you on the show. Oh, it's really my pleasure. Um, I am honored to be part of this book club. It's uh, an, such an impressive group of authors that, um, that you are highlighting. So I, I've known you for a long time as the world's leading expert on habits. Why did you write a book about them? Because the research in this area has been moving so fast, and we've learned so much in the last, oh, decade about how habits work, how they function, how we can best change them. And I wasn't seeing it on the bookshelves. So there's an awful lot in the science literature about it. I read it all the time. You might read it sometimes. But it just wasn't being shared with the public. And so that's what I wanted to do in writing this book is to explain to people how habits work. It's not something you can intuit. You know, we, we, we understand so much about ourselves, but our habits are not something that we can observe and understand in the same way as other parts of ourselves. So I have to ask before we dive into some of the material in the book, as a, as a habits expert, do you actually still have bad habits? No, everyone has bad habits, yes. Um, what are yours? Oh dear, really? <laughs> yeah, of course. We we want to we want to know the flawed person behind the brilliant science, of course. Okay. Well, sometimes uh, I tend to be a bit short with the people I love and live with. Um other bad habits. I like a glass of wine with dinner. And it sometimes turns into two. After that, I'm so Is that of... supposed to be a bad habit now? Oh, my God, I'm, yes. I'm having a hard time keeping up with the science there. Okay, keep going. Uh, two for women is bad. One on a regular basis is okay. Well, occasional is best. Regular is okay. okay. But two is too much. And fortunately, after two, I'm usually um, sound asleep. So it doesn't get worse. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. And so tell me then, applying all the science that you've accumulated, what you know about how you formed a habit like that, and then how you would go about breaking one. Oh, geez. Okay. Um, I love the taste of wine, good wine. And um, it's an easy habit to form. Wine goes wonderfully with good food. And I, yeah. I like good food. So it's an easy habit to form. Unfortunately, because it becomes a habit, I'm not asking myself, do I want wine with dinner tonight? It's just sort of a given. Yes, of course I'll have a glass of wine. Even if, <laughs> you know, in the um, ideal world, maybe I, I wouldn't tonight because I don't really need it or the food doesn't need it. Um, so I'm not asking myself why, do I want it? Um, I'm not asking myself how. It's just something that I sort of I automatically pull out the wine glass and, and pour myself a glass with dinner. And that's characteristic of habits. Is it something you do automatically without asking whether it's really what you want to do today? Your habits are things that have worked for you in the past, and you tend to just repeat them into the future, sort of regardless of whether it's the right thing now. So that's how you develop a wine drinking habit <laughs> and Good how it know. persists. How do you break it? If I wanted to, and this is the worst part, I don't. Um, I, I recognize that it's not necessarily good for your health, but and and yeah, I I'm, I'm not at the point where I'm going to break my glass of wine at dinner habit. Um if I wanted to, what I would do is I would put friction on it. So I'd make it more difficult. I might give away the wine glasses that I use. So I don't have those as a cue. I would not buy wine, so I'd actually have to go out and buy it when I'm making dinner at home and 
that would stop me immediately. Um, what else could I do to add friction? See, I haven't thought about this because it's not something that <laughs> I'm ready to give up. <laughs> um, Clearly. <laughs> so you add friction, you remove the cues, and um, probably the easiest time to relearn a habit or, or to, to relearn a different habit is when your context changes. So I actually move around a reasonable amount. I spend my summers at INSEAD, which is a business school in Paris. So if I wanted to make that change in my own behavior, a good time to do it would be when I'm in transition, when the old cues aren't there, when they're naturally shifting. And then I have to make a decision to reinstate that behavior again, and I could just decide not to. It's much easier when those existing cues aren't there. Got it. And and you're so, very much putting me on the spot here because now you're making me think. Well, that was my goal. Uh, I should be making this decision. <laughs> 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 well, I want to talk about that more, but I'll take you off the spot for a minute. So. Can you can you walk me through a little bit the the science of habits and, and in particular um, the idea that maybe willpower is not all it's cracked up to be if I want to form or break a habit? Yes. So I started studying habits. I, I my graduate research was all in attitudes and attitude change, and I studied that for quite a while. How people make decisions how we form attitudes, how we change our attitudes. And it became clear after a few years that I was only studying part of the change process. So I was studying what we do initially, our conscious sort of thinking selves, what we're aware of in our own behavior and decision making. But there's a huge piece about how people then persist that wasn't part of this process and wasn't part of what social psychologists were studying at the time. And that's when I became interested in habit, understanding that our brains are not just a single unified whole. We have a sense of ourselves and who we are, and that's part of our decision-making, conscious, aware selves. But there's other neural circuitry that help us persist and maintain that gets involved when we repeat a behavior over and over in a stable context and get a reward for it. What happens neurally is when you get a reward, your brain releases the neurotransmitter dopamine and that works for a very brief time to connect together what's currently in memory, where you are, what you did, in order to get that reward. And ultimately, if you repeat the same behavior over and over, what happens is that you learn these shortcuts, these sort of mental shortcuts or habits. What's the best thing to do in this context to get that same reward you got in the past. It's a sort of a probabilistic thing because you don't always get the reward, but it's just a best guess. And in fact, that reward that you got in the past might not really be the thing that you want to do that's best for you right now. So habits are what help people persist. And that's very different from consciousness, willpower, decision making. And because we only know the conscious part of ourselves, we think that willpower is how we persist. <laughs> but some of the work that's been done in the past couple of years has shown that even people who have high levels of willpower, so these are the people who score very high on those scales of how much willpower do you have? These people 
are not exerting willpower as they go around living their very successful lives. Instead, what they do is they form habits to automate the good behavior. So it's sort of like what, what I'm sure you do as a successful writer yourself. You have times when you write or places when you write, and you sort of structure it into your day. So the question of whether you're going to write is it, it never arises. Of course, we all have good writing days and bad writing days, and <laughs> that takes more conscious thought and deliberation. But the, the actual getting there and making yourself write, you've automated that. That's part of your habit. All successful authors have some writing habit. They write a maybe a certain number of words a day or a certain number of pages, certain amount of time. We have to do this if we're going to repeat behavior successfully. How do I know, Wendy, if a habit is good or bad for me? Because I think, you know, most of the habits that I assume are good are habits that I enjoy. Uh, or, you know, that I'm, I'm happy I didn't have to think about. And the bad habits are the ones generally that feel unpleasant. But sometimes the consequences of a habit are not the same as, you know, kind of the experience of, of executing the habit. And so do you have a way of, of teasing them apart and maybe any examples that jump to mind? Yeah, I think that we are much more aware of our bad habits than our good habits. So... Our good habits are what we would do anyway. And even if we didn't have the habit, they're things that we would make a decision to do. So we're not so aware with our good habits of the habit mechanism as with our bad habits. Our bad habits tend to roll off whether um, we want them to or not. And so we become a little bit more aware of them. In addition, though, the way I define good and bad habits is simply whether a particular behavior is consistent with your current goals. So mm -hmm. you might form a habit. Uh, so, so say you're at work today and you don't have time to I go am. get lunch. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> sure, you're very busy. You're at work. No time. So you go to the vending machine and you get yourself a pack of those donuts, those mini donuts, and you eat them and it works for you today because you're no longer quite so hungry. You didn't have to leave work. You were able to make all your meetings and it's a great stopgap. You do that if, so, so that's, a, that's a good decision today. You do that a few times and you start sort of noticing that uh, it has health consequences. You might gain a little weight. Um, you might feel kind of sluggish after that sugar high has gone. Um, it, it isn't really consistent with your health goals. So what started off as a, a, an okay behavior as, as a one-off thing then becomes something that is really not a good habit to maintain because it's not beneficial for your health. So that's how mm -hmm. behaviors that you actually enjoyed or worked for you, I mean, who enjoys those little donuts, but, but it worked for you once or twice, can become a habit that over time isn't particularly good for you. And that's where the challenge sets in because that's the point at which you're in a situation, it's crunch time, you, you have to go to your next meeting, you're hungry, what are you going to do? Well, what comes to mind is vending machine donuts. And it's just, <laughs> you're more likely to do that then. You, you can, the thing with habits is you can always make a decision not to do it. So habits come to mind very quickly once they become that shortcut. They're activated by the cues around us. And they typically come to mind faster than any decision you could make, which is why they're kind of sneaky, <laughs> because they're there <laughs> before you have 
made a decision to do something better. And if you have time, you can always stop yourself and say, no, I'm not going to do it this time. But that takes energy and it takes thought. And many of us are really busy and a bit overwhelmed by life as it is. So that's why habits have an advantage. Okay, so let let's talk about then you you opened up about your vices. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to talk about what most of the people who know me will tell me consistently is my worst habit. That Excellent. I'm not convinced <laughs> is even a bad habit, let alone I mean maybe this is my version of your wine drinking. Yeah. Which is I am chronically late to pretty much everything. Ah. Uh, there are exceptions. I don't show up too late to class. Uh, I, you know, I don't show up late if I have to be on stage, right? If there, if there's an event that's completely dependent on me, uh, where other people are counting on me, I don't want to let anyone down. But the rest of the time, if it's a meeting, a phone call, uh, a podcast interview, even, uh, I will be reliably five to 10 minutes behind and sometimes regrettably more. And I, my explanation of this habit is, uh, a couple things. One I just have a chronic inability to disengage from a task before it's done. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if I'm in the middle of writing a paper uh, and, you know, it comes time for me to have a meeting, well, I, when I scheduled the meeting, I didn't know I was going to be in the middle of writing this paper. And I want to I want to have that sense of completion uh, and finish the first task before I move on to the meeting. Uh, I think another factor that comes into play quite a bit is... I just find myself thinking that clock time is, it's a, it's, a, it's a human invention. It's an arbitrary invention. And I don't particularly care if people don't, you know, follow their calendars when I'm supposed to connect with them. In fact, sometimes I love it when people are late because it gives me more time to get the work done that I'm trying to finish. And so I, I realize I've just created a giant self-justifying house of cards here. Uh, but I really, I've had a hard time changing this habit because I don't fundamentally think it's a bad habit and I don't get why anyone cares. So can you talk to me about what's going on here and, uh, what you make of all this? Is this a bad habit? How do I know? It's not bothering you and clearly. But um... wait a second. It, it bothers, <laughs> it bothers me that it bothers other people. And okay. so it is sort of meta bothering me. It bothers me vicariously. How about that? Okay. But it doesn't bother you enough to want <laughs> to change it. So people have not gotten really angry with you or hurt. Oh, they have. Oh, really? Okay. They definitely have, yes. <laughs> um, my, my wife being the, the most probably frequent person. That's and exactly who I, I was I thinking. I care of. a lot that she's not, yeah, I care a lot <laughs> that she's not mad at me. And so I have actually gotten better at it for her quite a bit and she helps a lot with it. Actually, let's pause on this for a second. So uh, the way that Allison often gets me to be on time is she'll just ask me, are you gonna be late today? Mm. And it is so hard for me to say, yeah, I'm gonna be late today because I know that I'm, I'm already promising that she's gonna have an excuse to be mad at me uh, as opposed to you know trying to set good expectations for myself. And then also I wanna make a commitment to her that I'm gonna try not to let her down. And then I'm much more likely to show up on time. So what is she doing there? Can I apply this to other situations where I'm not as concerned about whether the other person's happy with me? You are clearly a busy person. <laughs> and you and, <laughs> and I completely understand about getting immersed in writing and wanting to think things through and, and work on things to the end, particularly abstract ideas, uh, yes, they can be hard to leave. Um, Are you trying to validate my habits? Is that what's happening here? Because it's working so far, <laughs> keep going. I'm empathizing with you <laughs> on how you got Thank into you. this I situation. <laughs> I think good, you're- Good, I'm with you, keep going. <laughs> I, I would recommend that Allison either tells you to be there 10 minutes before she expects you. I mean, that would be one way to sort of handle the problem. The way she has chosen is sort of to cue you ahead of time about her expectation. And that also is very smart. Um, I do think that you could cue yourself 
also. I used to try to, my younger son is very similar to this, and my older son <laughs> is just the opposite. He is there half an hour early for everything, and that <laughs> makes me crazy, just like the half hour late <laughs> does. So, but, because then he's sitting there waiting, and then when I show up on time, I feel like I've <laughs> made him um, wait on me, and I didn't do that, right? <laughs> but I still, I'm a mother, I still feel guilty. Um, so <laughs> I learned to, to adjust their schedule and their expectations, uh, you could cue yourself 10 minutes beforehand so that then you have that mm -hmm. 10 minutes to sort of wind down before you have to show up. You can do the queuing. Allison can do the queuing. Or um, you can just decide it's not worth it with some people <laughs> if it's a <laughs> challenge for you. Is this a bad habit? I would say if it's... Um, a challenge in your marriage, yes. You clearly <laughs> I wouldn't don't. call it a challenge. <laughs> a point but, of uh, frustration. Yes, yes. A point of contention in your marriage. I would say yes. Fix it. Fix it, Adam. <laughs> but <laughs> okay. but outside well, I'm, of I'm, that. I'm definitely on it at home. <laughs> yeah. Outside so of let me that, let me maybe. let me ask you then outside of that. So I you've you've now waded into this world where suddenly people who have no connection to your job know you exist and also know that you have knowledge about habits, which a lot of people are curious about. Mm -hmm. So I imagine you're starting to get a lot of cold emails from strangers asking for advice. And I, I found that at some point there were more people who wanted my time than I had hours in the day. Yeah. And so I, I felt like my only shot at squeezing them all in was, or as many of them in as I could fit was, you know, to be a little bit more flexible about time boundaries and hope that they would be understanding because they're asking for my time. And so what I've tried to do is I've tried to manage expectations. Uh, so when somebody signs up in my calendar for a call with me, it says, I'm, you know, I'm chronically late, five to 10 minutes behind. Here's why I think this happens. Uh, I apologize in <laughs> advance. And then okay. when they log into the call, uh, they actually hear, um, they hear some hold music, which is a song about being late. Do you think that's enough or do I need, do I need to change the habit? What kind of response are you getting from people to that? Uh, mostly people amused and appreciative, and then sometimes pleasantly surprised if I actually show up on time. Occasionally, somebody will say, you know, I don't really think you should tell people that you have this bad habit, because then you're setting negative expectations. Mm -hmm. And my response is, I would rather set realistic expectations than constantly disappoint people when I don't show up on time. Yes. I think that that's a very clever way to handle it. Um I think that that's helpful to people because then they don't make attributions to themselves about it. Instead, they understand it as this <laughs> is how you handle your schedule and it's just something that um, they have to deal with. And I, I, That's very clever. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, well, on that note, Wendy, I feel like I should probably tell you that the reason I was late today had nothing to do with you. I definitely care about you. It's all about my, me and my character flaw. You now know what uh, oh. what what goes goes through my head. But okay, so let's um, let's talk then about uh, what a habit is and is not. So you've talked about how it's unconscious or subconscious. Um, what's the difference between a habit and a ritual, and a habit and an addiction? Mm -hmm. So I think habits are part of addictions. Habits are sort of the behavioral program that underlies an addiction. But there's so much more that go along with addictions, right? So there's a lot of um, thoughtful drug-seeking and um, creative uh, uh, decision-making, how to get the drugs, how to keep using um, so, so habit is part of it, but it's not all of it with addiction. And I think of rituals, and I, I do have a chapter on rituals in the book, because I think they're so interesting. They're like habits that we adopt, not because they're necessarily working 
for us in any way. But because we have been told by others or sort of a, a, a used a pattern to calm us down, provide some external focus that's not on us, that sort of relieves anxiety. And the challenge with rituals, why, why they're a little different than habits, is that people want to think about them when they're doing them. Habits, we, we could think about our, our habits while we do them, but, but imagine if you tried to do that, it would just be totally overwhelming. You'd be constantly thinking all the time about what you're doing. Rituals are sort of small slices of behavior. Uh, athletes, particularly star athletes, are renowned mm -hmm. for their rituals before they go into some athletic, some game or contest. But fans have rituals too, right? And trying to support their team or their favorite player. And rituals, uh, rituals are also part of religion. So much of what happens in a church, synagogue, place of worship is a ritualized performance that you're supposed to be thinking about when you do it. And that's part of the challenge of rituals is how to stay conscious when you're doing something that you've done so many times before and how mm. to keep appreciating what the thing is that you're doing. Because it's that significance that relieves anxiety, gives you a sense of meaning, um, makes the world seem more predictable. If you stop focusing on it, it doesn't have that same beneficial effect because it all comes from the meaning you're putting on it. Great. And then what about an addiction? Well, well, as I was saying, that um, the part of addictions that are habits, and, and I think habits are only part of addiction, is... That's the behavioral thing that you have practiced over and over again. And that behavioral program that goes along with addiction is cued by the environments around us, just like our habits are. There's a, a strong sort of a physiological component as well that goes along with the addictive substance. But but the behavioral program is is very much just... Um, habit-driven and habit-based. I think it's partly why so many of these treatments that people go to where they take you out of your everyday context and sort of dry you out or give you a chance to reduce or, or stop using a, an addictive substance. There's, it's the reason why these programs often don't work is you learn not to use in a different context than the one you typically live in. And then you go back to everyday life once you've stopped using, but all those cues are still there. And they, are, they keep bringing drug use to mind. And that's, uh, it, it's hard to, to stop again when you go back. It's like you go through a pattern of learning not to use when you're in the program away from your daily life. And then you go back to your daily life and all those cues are there and you have to stop using all over again in a much more difficult circumstance, more challenging. So I think that's partly why addictions are tough to control through those sort of programs. Excellent. Okay, so let's uh, let's break down some examples of attempted habit change that didn't work, and try to figure out what's what's been done wrong. Okay. Uh, can you talk us a talk to us a little bit about the five a day campaign? Yeah. So I, I would hope that most of um, the listeners, the viewers, would be aware of the five a day campaign. That it doesn't date 
me too much. And if you know it, too, it doesn't date you too much. It was something that started in the 1990s in California with the produce, um, uh, the, the fresh fruit and, fruit and vegetable lobby. They convinced the um, National Cancer Institute to work with them to start promoting eating more fruits and vegetables. It, it, fruits and vegetables are good for us. It was a, it was a good, good initiative. And it's so interesting that when the program started, very low percentage, about 8% of the U.S. population knew that they should be eating five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And five years later, the program had been very successful. And the program consisted of a lot of information about fruits and vegetables. Um, as a school kid, you were taken on tours of the supermarket. Fruits and vegetables had stickers on them, all ways of educating the public about eating more fruit and vegetables. And about five years after the program started, over a third of the U.S. population knew that they should be eating five servings a day. So that's a tremendously successful program. Yeah. I don't know any other health initiative that's had that impact. But the problem was, was that it changed people's beliefs. It educated all of us. But it didn't change our behavior. At the beginning of the program, about 11% of the U.S. population was actually eating five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And 10 years later, it was still 11%. And since then, even though more and more of us have become aware this is what we should be doing, the actual numbers of people eating five servings a day have decreased. So... So it was tremendously successful in one case, which is changing people's beliefs, educating them. But it wasn't successful at changing their behavior. And that's a great example of um, how what we know doesn't always translate into what we do, at least when it's a habit. Because eating is really habitual, right? We tend to do it at the same times. We tend to eat the same things. We um, tend to eat in the same places. And we have habits. We've all formed habits around eating. And we formed habits around purchasing food as well. So at the beginning of the program, people probably went down their usual couple of aisles in the grocery store, maybe not anywhere near the produce section. And after the program had been on for a few years, they were still going down those same few aisles. It just didn't shift what we were doing. Hmm. And so often you see that in health settings that we think educating people is enough. And it is for some kinds of things when we're making one-off decisions, when we're trying to decide something new for ourselves. But when we're repeating behavior over and over, that habit tends to persist, even when our knowledge changes. Because of those somewhat separate systems, neural systems that I was talking about, where there's persistence, persistence neural circuitry, and then there's the decision-making systems that are somewhat separate. They're connected, but they can function separately. Right. Got so, it. And so if you were going to redesign the campaign, what mm -hmm. would you change? I would make fruits and vegetables available to people in places where they typically shopped for other more packaged food. It was so interesting. Um, Going in, if, if you travel much, you go to other countries, and you see that in these convenience stores, there's fresh fruit and vegetables available, much less of the sort of packaged sweet cake cookie stuff. And yeah. if it's accessible, 
you're just much more likely to eat it. I um, I live, I, I recently moved to a place that has a farmer's market close by. And I find myself walking through there on my way home from the office some days. And I just start buying things without actually having made a decision to do so. But because it's there, it's easier. And, and in experiments, yeah. we've seen the same thing, right? If you have a bowl of apple slices right in front of you and a bowl of buttered popcorn where you have to just, you can see it, smell it, but you just have to reach a little. Or the reverse. You have the buttered popcorn right in front of you and the apple slices where you just have to reach for them. When the popcorn's close by, people eat three times as many calories as when the apple slices are close by. <laughs> we're, wow. we're really um, very sensitive to proximity in ways that doesn't make sense to our rational decision-making selves, but is very, um, it, it, it tends to direct what we do and so what habits we form. So, so that's this, how uh, I change. This reminds me of when, yeah. I like it. it. It actually reminds me of when uh, when I lived in Northern England and I went grocery shopping in what was about, well, to me it was the size of a convenience store. There it was a grocery store. And the, the fresh fruit and vegetables were where we would normally have the candy in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I went looking for cereal and Finally, I found in a very remote corner of the store uh, a little section that was labeled disgustingly sugared American cereals. <laughs> and I, I, I immediately felt like a bad person for even mm -hmm. wanting to buy them. So I, I think that's a, that's a good example of, of taking away the contextual cue. Exactly. And probably the having to search for them would be enough to dissuade most people. So this tells us something about you, Adam that you stuck with it. <laughs> Maybe more than you wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, re I really wanted the sugared cereals. Uh, so on the flip side, what about successful campaigns? So, you know, car seats have been adopted. Seat belts are now a habit, which they didn't used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, people, a lot of people have broken their smoking habits. Uh, how, have, uh, how have those habit changes worked? Or if you went to Australia, uh, drunk driving or sunscreen, mm -hmm. What can we learn from those success cases? Yeah, there are a number of really impressive su success cases. And um, the anti-smoking campaign is probably the, um, the, it, it's, it's the one we all know the, the most about. So in the 60s and the 70s, uh, almost half of the US population smoked. And we started to learn in the mid 60s that it was actually bad for us. We learned that it caused cancer. It has all kinds of, it's associated with all kinds of heart disease. So the, um, the Surgeon General released a report in the mid 60s saying that smoking was bad for us. Reader's Digest had an article, everyone read Reader's Digest back then. They had an article entitled Cancer by the Carton, we were being educated about cigarettes and their harm. But people's behavior didn't change that much until we started putting friction on smoking. So friction, um, as you know, Kurt Lewin was a famous psychologist who believed that you could think of psychological forces, the ones that influence our behavior, very similar to physical forces in the environment like gravity or friction. And he argued that our behavior is influenced by driving forces and resisting friction-inducing forces. The anti-smoking campaigns set friction on our behavior, set resisting forces, making it difficult for us to smoke, um, 
by taxing cigarettes. So they became expensive. And then we set bans in public places so people couldn't smoke easily in the workplace or in restaurants or in bars. And finally, we actually took them off the shelves in the grocery store because there needs to be somebody checking your age. So you can't just pick them up and stick them in your shopping basket anymore. You actually have to go ask someone and describe what it is you're looking for. Um, all of those things added friction. And at that point, smoking rates fell. Right now, they're about 15% in the U.S., only 15% of us smoke, which is an incredible success story, I think. Um, and clearly, smoking rates are higher in some parts of the country. The parts that used to um, be the primary tobacco growing areas, um, maybe some parts of the South, rural, poorer areas. But overall, it's been tremendously successful. And so that, that the story there is really about not changing people's desires or educating them. The story is about making it more difficult so people will do the right thing the thing that's healthy for them and for people around them. Well, that, that goes to another interesting point that you make in the book, which is I really enjoyed your analysis of the marshmallow test. <laughs> I feel like, you know, the, the, the popular understanding of the test is, okay, so Walter Michelle, you know, offers preschoolers the opportunity to either get one marshmallow now or wait for 15 minutes and then get a second one. And then if you follow the only about quarter of the kids who are able to delay gratification for the next decade and a half, they do better in school, they get higher SAT scores, uh, really impressive, and that even goes on to predict their career success. And so we have this great story about how kids who have early willpower uh, are setting themselves up for later success. And what you highlight is something that I think is often overlooked, which is the kids with willpower didn't always use it. Uh, some of them created friction. And so can you talk a little bit about what we can learn from the kids who managed to resist the temptation of the one marshmallow now uh, and how that might apply to other situations in, in our lives? Yeah. So, so it, it's a fascinating set of, of studies, and the, the data are just really interesting. They don't always hold, we have learned, um, with lower income, more diverse samples than, um, than Michelle was dealing with. But they hold enough so that a lot of us believed that willpower early on in life predicted all kinds of success, as you're saying. What isn't highlighted is that Michelle had a second condition in many of his studies. And that is, instead of sticking the marshmallow right in front of the kid, so the kid had to look at it, smell it, taste it <laughs> while they were waiting, he would put it under something. So the kid could still eat it if they wanted to. They could lift up the lid and <laughs> grab the marshmallow. But it was hidden from sight. They knew it was there. They saw it placed there, but it was just a, a, a lid put over it. And many more kids were able to resist eating it the whole time. But also, at that point, whether you resisted or not didn't predict much of anything later in life because so many more people mm -hmm. resisted. It was like that became the norm. And this is just... it's. This is the logic of friction. You make things a little more difficult, and to our rational thinking selves, fine, I can still eat it, and I will. But to our actual behavior, it changes everything. What's easily accessible is what we do. What is less easily accessible becomes something less likely. And, and there's a, there's a modern-day version of this that was done with cell phones. Um, 
bear with me here. It's of course. A, it's a bit of a story. We all know that our cell phones are being monitored constantly in all kinds of different ways. But this analysis was how far people traveled to a paid fitness center. And this was a data analytics company that um, followed thousands of cell phones across two months in 2017. What they found was that cell phones, and we assumed the people holding them, that traveled 3.6 miles to go to the gym, to go to a paid fitness center, actually went there five times a month. So that's a pretty reasonable exercise habit. But when people were, and their cell phones, were traveling over five miles to get to the gym, they only went once a month on average. Wow. So that simple proximity, making things easy, is the difference between having an exercise habit and not. <laughs> it's really the is, same is as... Is this the... Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Is this the case for, for the home gym? It should be, shouldn't it? <laughs> I yeah. know so many I mean, many why would anyone people... go to the gym? Exactly. I know so many people who have bought fitness equipment and don't use it. And I think there's one other piece to that home gym question, which is we don't always buy the piece of equipment we like. And we don't always spend enough money on that home exercise thing to make it very enjoyable. Because if you buy cheap equipment, it's not much fun to use. Um, I, I have to admit, I did buy myself an elliptical. And I use it constantly. It's a reasonable quality one. And I knew before I bought it that the elliptical was the part of gym equipment I wanted to use. But getting yourself something that you don't want and putting it in your house and expecting proximity alone to work mm, probably <laughs> won't, won't happen. But traveling to a fitness center where you have a whole array of things or and traveling to a close fitness center where you have a whole array of things, or getting yourself a piece of equipment you really do like, those those should work. So this goes to the distinction between breaking bad habits and forming good ones. At some level, if, if you're someone who doesn't exercise enough, you could frame it either way, mm -hmm. right? You could say, okay, I want to break my bad habit of doing things other than going to the gym, or I want to form a new good habit of of going and working out more often. Uh, are the strategies different depending on whether I want to break the bad one or form a new one? They're definitely different. And they're different in this way. I would say you're probably not breaking a bad habit of going to the gym because there's not one specific thing you're doing all day that stops you from going to the gym. Instead, what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out how to insert a new behavior into your daily routine or lifestyle, and that's forming a new habit. When you're trying to break a bad Good. habit, so, yeah. so when you're trying to break a bad habit, you, you want to put friction on it or remove cues. Right? Those are the two things you can do. If there's something specific you want to stop doing, those are two good ways to do it. A third way is you can form a good habit that competes with the bad habit that you have, the specific thing you're doing. So if you have a pattern of going home at night, sitting on the sofa, and you decide that's what you're going to change, then you have a habit you want to change, a specific one, which is not just start exercising. It's I want to quit sitting on my sofa at night. <laughs> then you want to change the cues to that, and you want to make it more difficult for yourself to do that. Maybe get a dog that wants to go walking with you in the evening. And so you can't sit 
on the sofa as easily. Or maybe you have a friend who wants to work out with you in the evening, and so you start doing that. Um, those would be ways of starting to form a good habit that competes with your old one. So you can start making this really complex, right? Both breaking a bad one and starting a new one, or you can focus on the bad or focus on starting a new one. Any of those pieces are possible. They're all parts of learning. I have a friend who, when he wants to go to the gym the next morning, uh, he sleeps in his gym clothes the night before. Uh, where, where does that fit into this whole puzzle? That's great. He's making it easier for himself. He's removing some of the friction. Because <laughs> when you get up, you don't feel like going to the gym, you're in your pajamas, you're making it hard on yourself. You get up, you don't feel like going to the gym, you're in your gym clothes. It's much easier <laughs> to just put your shoes on and go out the door. So that's a very smart strategy for removing friction. You've also written about how it's helpful to give yourself a reward to yeah. reinforce the habit. So what, what would that look like? That's useful in starting a new habit. It doesn't matter that much if you are trying to change an old one. And that's because our habits are cued automatically. As I said, they're what comes to mind first. And so they're already in your mind. And whether you want the reward or not is not what's most salient. Instead, it's the behavior. And it's usually just easier to act on whatever is in mind than to shift um, and think, oh, do I really want this now? So let me give you an example of that phenomenon. I, along with a colleague of mine, David Neal, um, did a study in a local movie theater where we gave people popcorn. Some people got stale popcorn. Others got fresh popcorn. And no one knew that there was stale popcorn um, being handed out. We asked people, and everyone could say they hated the stale popcorn. They liked the fresh. But if they had habits to eat popcorn in the movie cinema, they ate the same amount, regardless of whether it was fresh or stale. <laughs> It's not the reward of the popcorn, the taste, the crunchiness that's driving that behavior. It's being in the movie cinema and having something in your hand like you did in the past. So changing mm. the reward doesn't work for changing a bad habit. It's not an efficient way to do it. Adding rewards, though, are ways we form new habits because that's when you add the reward, that's when you get the dopamine release that starts tying together the information you have in memory. So adding rewards helps build new habits. It, it's, it's a logical idea. We're going to repeat things we enjoy much more than things we don't. So you're just much more likely to form a habit for something you enjoy doing than for something that you don't. But once the habit's formed, it tends to be cued by the environment around you, and the reward becomes less important. So once a habit's formed, shifting the reward doesn't have that much impact. Is that too confusing? There are... No, no, it's helpful, actually. Uh, there are all these these myths out there about how long it takes to form a new habit. Uh, your lab has actually studied this. How long does it really take, and what kinds of activities are faster and slower? Yeah, so what when forming a habit, uh, what you're doing is you're essentially learning something. And it's just going to take longer to learn something that's really complex, that has many steps, that maybe that involves other people, because other people are sometimes late, as you know. Um, what? <laughs> Never. <laughs> and um, it just takes longer to form a habit for something that's complex than something that's simple. 
in um, uh, one of my colleagues actually did some research on this and concluded that two to three months is probably the minimum amount of time for a behavior to become really automated in the sense that it's your go-to thing that you do without having to think much about it. You don't have to make a decision. It's just there in your mind and you act on it. And she was looking at simple health behaviors that we do uh, every day in the same context. So two to three months is a lot longer <laughs> than what most people think. Most people think eh, 21 days, we've all heard that. That's not true. There's not much evidence. There's no evidence behind that. It, that just seems like a, 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 a workable amount of time, but it's not necessarily how long it's going to take you to form a habit. But the, the good okay. news... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that's the bad news. There's some good news, though, that you, you can fall off the wagon and get back on, right? Yes. That you can actually not do the new habit for a few days. And once you get back to it, your habit memory, because it changes so slowly, this is a very slow learning. I mean, two to three months is a lot of time. Slow learning kind of a, a mechanism. It's a slow learning memory system. When you get back to it, it's just about at the same level as it was when you left off. So you haven't hurt yourself if you quit for a short amount of time and then get back to it. And we all fall off the wagon, as you say, once in a while with our good habits that we're trying to form. So does that mean if, I, I feel like I know a lot of people who set New Year's resolutions, they keep them for all of January, then they, they slip up in February and they give up and they say, okay, I have to wait till next year to try again. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't give up? Yes, that's exactly what it means. It means they've done the first part, the most difficult part, because that's when they have to put in the most effort when they start. Each time you do it, it should get slightly easier, incrementally easier, less thoughtful, less effortful. Those are only slight shifts each time, but what you're doing is you really, if you wait until next January, then you're back to where you were when you started. And you have to go through that effortful process again. Mm -hmm. So one of the places I think about habits a lot, obviously, is the workplace. And mm -hmm. as an organizational psychologist, I get asked pretty frequently by leaders and managers how they can help their employees form more productive habits, how they can you know, get them focused on work as opposed to maybe hanging out too much on YouTube or social media. And I think one of my favorite studies I came across recently was uh, was Dylan Miner, who showed that if you ended up randomly sitting next to someone who was extremely productive, your productivity mm -hmm. spiked by about 10%. Oh, and that made wonderful. me wonder if habits are, yeah, do you think maybe habits can be contagious? Um, is that effect, you know, people with maybe bad working habits picking up some of the good habits of their more productive peers? H how do you think about habits spreading from one person to another in a work group? Well, I do think that the people around us either help us form good habits or um, keep us <laughs> in our bad habits. Um, like Allison is cueing you to be on time, keep forming, start forming a good habit of being on time with her. Um, other yeah. people around us can be cues to keep us focused and not distracted by all the media that's available. So it makes perfect sense to me that someone who you're working with, if they have really good work habits, they're going to start cueing your work habits and perhaps help you learn to focus and concentrate in the same way and produce at the same high level. So those are, that's a great study. I didn't know about it, but um, very interesting. 
I wonder about the the reverse too. So I've noticed often, and these are, I guess, the kinds of questions that as a fellow psychologist, I should just go and gather data on, but I have you here. So let me just ask you to make sense of it instead. Uh, one of the places where I'm most productive is on airplanes. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like, you know, there's a consistent routine. The moment, you know, the plane is level, they'll take out my computer. And my goal is to sit there working until, uh, until the flight attendant, well, most, in most cases, they literally will drag the computer out of my hands and say, you really have to pack it up now. And I noticed that part of what motivates me, aside from the consistency of the cues and the, you know, the, the habit that I've formed over years, is I look at the people around me and I see some of them watching movies and TV shows. And I think I would so much rather have time to do that with my family when I'm back home. And so that becomes, I guess, the contrast between other people using time more unproductively and my opportunity to either catch up or not fall behind uh, becomes motivating as well. So do you think that sometimes seeing other people's bad habits can motivate you to adopt better ones? Well, I don't know that those are bad habits for them. I right? know. I when shouldn't be judging them. <laughs> yeah. When you're on an airplane, it is, and, and you are in this tight space, and, and you probably don't want to talk to the person next to you. Because definitely not. If they turn out to be someone who talks a lot, that can get difficult to disengage. Um, you don't have a choice <laughs> of who who's sitting next to you. So, um, I think it makes sense for some people to um, watch videos and read books. I have exactly the same reaction to being in an airplane as you do. I use it as a time when I know that. I won't have people calling me. I mean, I do get emails if I decide to log on to that. And sometimes I do, sometimes I decide not to um, to get on Wi-Fi, on the Wi-Fi in airplanes. But I've always thought, darn, I wish my university could rent an airplane that I could go sit in <laughs> and just be as productive <laughs> two days a week as I am on an airplane when I fly. And I really think that I have practiced, and I bet you did too, just practiced when there wasn't Wi-Fi available and we started having laptops that we could drag with us. Yeah. It became a sort of a space and a time where we had no distractions. And we got so used to working that way that we formed a habit. And it's one that, that sounds like it works for you, really works for me. So it's not one I want to shift. And it's one that repeats and yeah, it makes tr travel so much more pleasant. Because as you say, when you get home, then your to-do list is so much smaller, and you can actually spend time with the people you want to spend time with. Many benefits. That's so interesting. I never thought about the fact that I'd formed the habit before Wi-Fi, but you're, you're exactly right. And that makes me wonder, of course, if there's a whole generation now being disadvantaged yeah. in terms of you know, flight productivity habits by the fact that they've always had Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are challenges to electronic communication, certainly. Okay, so before we wrap up, I want to loop back to the habit ritual distinction for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I were both at a conference over the summer uh, where our colleague Mike Norton did something very entertaining. Uh, he asked uh, he asked us to stand up if we um, if we always take a shower before brushing our teeth in the morning, and then he had a second group to do the opposite, and then he asked how many of us would be bothered by switching. And he said, if, if you're upset by the idea of changing the order, that's not a habit for you. It's a ritual. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I felt like it was a little aha moment because uh, I didn't care at all. I just, whatever. Um, but Angela Duckworth was, uh, was really bothered by, uh, by the, the very idea that anybody would have these habits. And she said, no, you brush your teeth in the shower. It's more efficient. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's Angela. And, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was such an Angela moment, but it also, it, I have to say that when I spend time around super successful, highly productive people, I'm always struck by these, um, 
these tiny sort of habit hacks that they have, and that that's obviously one of Angela's. Um, are these are these common? Should we all have some of them, or is that just a quirk? Oh no, I think we all it people who um, are high producing, very productive, successful individuals. You're squeezing an awful lot into a short amount of time, and in order to do that. Of course, you develop these patterns of how to do things. I I don't know that I completely bought Michael's <laughs> distinction between <laughs> habits and rituals, but it does go along with the idea that rituals, we impose meaning on them. So if they were done a different way, it wouldn't have the same meaning to us. But, you know, habits also have a certain pattern to them. And although you wouldn't feel quite as bad, maybe, if you did them in a slightly different way, you'd have to think about it in order to alter the sequence that you've practiced so much. And that thought and effort that it takes to alter also is a little, makes you a little uncomfortable. <laughs> Um, we don't like to have to think about things that aren't that important to us. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure, yeah. I think that there are reasons why doing things in ways we're not comfortable with always is a little unsettling. Well, this has been fun as always. Thank you for joining <laughs> us. And I can't wait to see what your next big idea is. I, I hope that I get to share it with you. To be continued. Thanks, Wendy. <laughs> Bye, Adam.